Contend, O Lord, with my contenders. Fight those who fight me. Take up your buckler and shield. Arise in my defense, Lord, my mighty help. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, therefore I ask of Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison. Christe eleison. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that though in our weakness we fail, we may be revived through the passion of your only begotten Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one with whom I am pleased, upon whom I have put my spirit he shall bring forth justice to the nations, not crying out, not shouting, not making his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoldering wick he shall not quench, until he establishes justice on the earth. The coastlands will wait for his teaching. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spreads out the earth with its crops who gives breath to its people and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you for the victory of justice. I have grasped you by the hand. I formed you and set you as a covenant of the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out prisoners from confinement and from the dungeon those who live in darkness. The word of the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The, the Lord, Lord is, is my light and my salvation. salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is my life's refuge. Of whom should I be afraid? The Lord, the Lord is, is my, my light, light and my salvation. salvation. When evildoers come at me to devour my flesh, my foes and my enemies themselves stumble and fall. The Lord, the Lord is, is my, my light, light and, and my, my salvation. salvation. Though an army encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war be waged upon me, even then will I trust. The Lord, the Lord is, is my, my light, light and, and my, my salvation. salvation. I believe that I shall see the bounty of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord with courage. Be stout-hearted and wait for the Lord. The, the Lord, Lord is, is my, my light and my salvation. salvation. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. The reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. They gave a dinner for him there, and Martha served, while Lazarus was one of those reclining at table with him. Mary took a liter of costly perfumed oil made from genuine aromatic nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and dried them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Then Judas the Iscariot, one of his disciples, and the one who would betray him, said, Why was this oil not sold for three hundred days' wages, and given to the poor? 
He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and held the money bag and used to steal the contributions. So Jesus said, leave her alone. Let her keep this for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The large crowd of the Jews found out that he was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And the chief priests plotted to kill Lazarus too, because many of the Jews were turning away and believing in Jesus because of him. The Gospel of the Lord. So one of the uh, great memories I have from my childhood uh, growing up um, with my parents and the rest of my siblings is my uh, parents would take the time to read to us when we were very uh, small children, and I always really enjoyed that. Um, and we had a number of different religious books, as I'm sure a lot of Catholic families do, about the saints and uh, children's Bibles and everything. I remember there was, I think there was one or two uh, children's Bibles we had that I really enjoyed. They had some pretty um, vivid imagery and great illustrations, and as a little kid, you always like looking at the pictures. Um, and I remember one of them was about the story of Cain and Abel, and that was one of the uh, one of the many stories that my parents would read to us and, and do a little teaching about. And I don't know for whatever reason um, that one in particular has stuck out to me even all these years later. And I remember uh, my dad at least on one occasion, if probably more than one, but when he would tell us that story, and he would tell us the difference between Cain and Abel and how they were sacrificing to God and why Cain's sacrifice was not accepted while Abel's was, was that uh, Abel had sacrificed the best. He, was a, uh, he had brought um, the best of his, uh, of his sheep to the Lord and to sacrifice. And that is why God found that sacrifice pleasing, and Cain presumably didn't, and that is why he's filled with jealousy at his brother. But that was something that I remember my dad repeating, uh, repeating to us uh, as little children and then through our lives, that we always give God our best, right? That we always give God the best of what we have to offer. And this gospel today is a great illustration of that, right? That there is nothing too good that we have that we shouldn't, that we shouldn't offer to Jesus, and this is actually really, Jesus gives, himself gives us the answer to every now and again. We might hear this brought, be brought up in the culture, or maybe even have someone ask us, well, you know, why does the church have all of this wealth? You know, why, did, why does the church spend all this money on, you know, um, marble pillars and beautiful churches and, you know, golden vessels and, and everything like that? Um, well, the, quite simply, the answer is, is not because God needs it, but because we need it, <laughs> right? Um, it's... Uh, it's really, it's ultimately for us, it, it, because it's, it's for God, um, but it's really, it's for us in our relationship with God. And so there is nothing that we have that we can offer that is too good for him. And Jesus answers the objection about feeding the poor, selling this and, and feeding the poor, saying, look, you always have the poor with you, and there's enough money, there's enough resources in the world, you can always do good to the poor, you will always be able to provide for the poor. And so that's, that's really uh, not an appropriate objection. And also, too, another, not to get too far afield of this, but I remember another priest saying one time, you know, the beautiful buildings and artwork that the church has, it's for everybody. So it's not just for the rich and wealthy. It is for the poor people. And where else can a poor person feel rich but being able to go into a beautiful cathedral and know that that's his just as much as it is uh, anyone else's? Right, so there's nothing that we have that is too good for God. And Jesus acknowledges and, um, and accepts, right, in a very beautiful way, the waste, so to speak, quote-unquote, the waste that Mary gives to him by breaking this liter of costly nard and pouring it all over him, all, all in one sitting, right? Not, uh, she's not um, you know, measuring it out drop by drop or a few drops at a time. She just you know, breaks the thing and pours it completely uh, all empties it all out on Jesus, right? And this is something that Jesus accepts and is filled with great joy at being able to receive because he sees the lavishness that is offered to him by Mary. But this is the only appropriate response to Jesus who lavishes his love on us. As we are getting into Passion Week here, um, that's exactly what we're celebrating, right? That Jesus loves us so much that he lavishes his life, he pours it out 
for us, gives us absolutely everything that he has, right? I mean, you want to talk about a waste in one sense, the Son of God, the immortal Son of God, you're wasting his life for us, for sinful human beings that have abandoned and rejected him, right? And yet we are not too good for sacrifice in the eyes of God. And so Jesus should not be too good for anything that we have to offer. And I would say, again, that's something as we're... Um, you know, as our movements are restricted and we're spending a lot more time in, in our home and we ha- seem to have more time on our hands, uh, to look at uh, increasing our time of prayer and saying, all right, Jesus, how can I waste some time with you, right? Even if I feel like prayer is a waste of time, good, in the best sense of the word, it is a waste, a good waste of time to spend and waste time with Jesus. And so I think that's really what we can take away from this gospel passage, that we always want to give Jesus, the best of what we have to offer, especially now, especially time, right? Time is one of the most precious things that we have to offer, and time spent with Jesus is never truly wasted. I'd like to just end with a short passage from St. Augustine, who I think speaks to this uh, very well. Um, and especially, this is good, uh, I think, for us to focus on as we're e- uh, entering into Passion Week. Again, understanding how much Jesus loves us, that he went through this for our sake. So he says, the death of the Lord our God should not be a cause of shame for us. Rather, it should be our greatest hope, our greatest glory. In taking upon himself the death he found in us, he has most faithfully promised to give us life in him, such as we cannot have of ourselves. He loved us so much sinless that sinless in himself, he suffered for us sinners the punishment we deserved for our sins. How then can he fail to give us the reward we deserve for our righteousness, for he is the source of righteousness? How can he whose promises are true fail to reward the saints when he bore the punishment of sinners, though without sin himself? Now let us offer to our Heavenly Father our prayers and our needs. For Pope Francis and all clergy, may God give them courage in their vocation and strength in leading our church in prayer during this Holy Week. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For government officials, may God give them wisdom in making decisions that reflect the goodness of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who struggle to see goodness or beauty in their lives, may God open their eyes to his generous work all around them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those gathered here, may God grant us purity of heart and clarity of vision in seeing clearly the redemption won for us through the Paschal Mystery. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have died, for lives lost to the coronavirus, For all Holy Family parishioners who died on this date, including Mary Walker, Cornelius Wentenhall, Mary Root, and Barbara Daly, may they be anointed by Christ as he welcomes them into his heavenly kingdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for the repose of the soul of Brandy Irvine, for whom this Mass is being offered, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us. We ask for the grace to always lavish our love on you as you have lavished your love on us. And we ask you to please hear and answer these prayers and all the prayers that we hold in our hearts. They are all made to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all of this holy church. Look graciously, O Lord, upon the sacred mysteries we celebrate here, and may what you have mercifully provided to cancel the judgment we incurred bear for us fruits in eternal life through Christ our Lord. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord, for the days of his saving passion and glorious resurrection are approaching, by which the pride of the ancient foe is vanquished, and the mystery of our redemption in Christ is celebrated. Through him the host of angels adores your majesty and rejoices in your presence forever. May our voices, we pray, join with theirs in one chorus of exultant praise as we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, and giving thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
the mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Earl, our Bishop, Carl, our Bishop Emeritus, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of, of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. On you stay. Quit holy spectata mundi, miserere nobis. An you stay, quit holy spectata mundi, miserere nobis. An you stay, quit holy spectata mundi. Dona nobis pache. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Turn your ear towards me on the day when I call. Speedily answer me. And together let us pray our spiritual prayer of communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you are already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. Visit your people, O Lord, we pray. And with ever watchful love, look upon the hearts dedicated to you by means of these sacred mysteries, so that under your protection we may keep safe this remedy of eternal salvation, which by your mercy we have received. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Bow down for the blessing. May your protection, O Lord, we pray, defend the humble and keep ever safe those who trust in your mercy, that they may celebrate the Paschal festivities not only with bodily observance, but above all with purity of mind, through Christ our Lord. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. St. Michael, the Archangel. Defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan 
all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. Okay, good morning, everyone. I figured out the best of both worlds where I don't have to take have my phone on me during Mass, but it's still right here. It's just in my coat pocket, so hopefully that'll make things go a little more smoother this time. All right. Hope everyone's uh, having a blessed uh, beginning of the Passion Week so far. So we're getting right, uh, yeah, first, well, I guess technically yesterday was the first full day. But uh, let's see here. I think we got first... Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, first question here. Why is the processional crucifix now draped in red? Why is it? Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> we found a red piece of cloth. No, we're, it's, um, it's uh, now draped in red for Passion Sunday, right? So Passion Sunday, we were wearing red yesterday, red vestments uh, to show the, the passion of our Lord. And uh, we'll be also doing that on um, uh, Good Friday. Good Friday liturgy is uh, also red as well. So um, matching the color of the day. So I think that's a, that's a fairly simple, straightforward enough explanation, but good question. Um, all right, so that one, all right, good. So I think we're still just waiting on a, on a few more to come in. That was the first one we had right off the bat. So we'll uh, wait and see if uh, we have anyone else. Otherwise, it'll just be a very, very quick, uh, quick Q&A afterwards. <laughs> I was just thinking about that. Oh, okay. Explain the purpose of palms given out and placed in homes. Um, I think, so maybe, maybe this, I'm just going to go with the explanation here um, of maybe if it's someone that's not quite understanding what it is that we're doing with the palms, that sounds what it's like. So it's, it's a tradition that we have in the, in the church, right? one of those uh, small tea traditions. Um, so we distribute normally, if, if uh, this were a normal year, we would have had... Um, Palm Sunday procession with everybody, uh, you know, with everyone gathered. And then in that procession, we give everyone palms, and then there's a procession with everyone holding palms as they come into the church. And so it's just a way of, it's a uh, physical representation or reminder of, um, uh, of Jesus' triumphal procession and entrance into Jerusalem. And uh, with, the, with the people in Jerusalem laying the palm branches down and, and holding those, so it's, a, it's our commemoration of that. And then people often will... Um, take them back home for the year, and they'll have palms there for the year until the next Palm Sunday. Um, so oftentimes that's just, just a, that's a tradition. We have a blessing of the palms, and people keep it. Some people do some pretty incredible, intricate work with them. Some people do these, like, incredible crucifix, palm crucifixes, or they've got these, you know, massive palms that are like 50 of them bound together. I, so some people are very talented with them. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I think the tradition would just be then uh, for for people that want to keep them year-round, uh, kind of like a family tradition. There's not like a set, you know, uh, liturgical tradition or commandment from the church that you have to... I, the only thing that we ask is that after, if you're given a blessed palm, that you just treat it with respect and reverence throughout the year because it is a blessed object. And that actually goes really uh, nicely here into, um, uh, into the next question that we had. What is the proper way to dispose of palms from last year? Um, and so the proper way, well, so there are a couple of ways. For us here at Holy, uh, Holy Family in Grim Lake, you can drop them by. We always tell people they can uh, uh, drop them by the office or um, it, because we just burn them. We, traditionally, now I don't know, I don't think we do this, but I think a lot of places, some places do, they'll use the palms from last year after they're burned for the next year's Ash Wednesday, the ashes. We used to. We don't do it. You can, uh, so some places still do that. But you can uh, always, so you can drop them here. Um, but the other, another proper, uh, and just in general, a proper way of disposing of, of holy things is either through burning or burying. Um, so if, if you, you can, uh, if, you, if you burn the palms, then to dispose of the ashes directly into the ground. So they just go directly, uh, you know, maybe like dig a small hole and put them directly into the ground. And that's the same way for like a Bible. If you, have, if you have an old tattered or ripped up Bible or something like that, right, we don't just throw that in the trash because it's the word of God. 
Um, we just we dispose of it. We can again, you can burn it and then just put the ashes in the ground, or you can put the whole Bible, uh, bury the whole Bible directly in the ground. So um, that's generally the way we dispose of holy or blessed things that have um, worn out their use or become broken or unusable in some way. But that's a that's a fantastic question. So uh, good for everyone to know. Um, okay. Why do we baptize adults once a year when in Acts 16, Paul baptized adults immediately? That is another fantastic question. Um, we, uh, we baptize it. Well, I should say this. Um, we generally baptize adults once a year. So that's normal. Um, we can, you can baptize, someone can be baptized at any time, technically speaking. Um, the reason we normally do it once a year is uh, because they're part of the RCIA program. And so the RCIA program is for, um, you know, just so people have uh, a proper understanding and they have a full year, almost a full year of, uh, of understanding what they're saying yes to, right, what it means to be a Christian. And so it's just a time for instruction for them. Um, that's really the main purpose. But that can, that can depend wildly. I mean, if there's someone that, um, you know, there are exceptions to that. If someone is... Um, it, well, they don't even have to be well educated, but if they have a proper understanding of what of what the sacrament is, and they want it and desire it, and they don't have any objections to what the church teaches on on all the, I mean, that's the other thing too is we want to make sure that people believe and profess everything the Catholic Church holds and professes to be true. Because if you're being baptized Catholic, that's kind of what it means. And so, there's obviously a lot to being Catholic, and so we want to make sure people have an understanding of what all of those teachings are. But if someone uh, accepts all of those, they have no um, issues with them, they really want it, no, you can, you can be, um, yeah, you can be baptized before. I've, I've done one in my priesthood so far. I've done one uh, deathbed baptism before where the person was uh, unconscious and I baptized them and confirmed them and obviously they didn't have a chance to go through RCIA. So uh, they can, uh, you know, you can technically be baptized at any time, but once a year, RCIA is typical um, just because people have a chance. Um, oh, sorry, a little distraction over here. Um, because we have a, uh, uh, so sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, so just so people have a chance to understand fully what the Catholic Church is and, and what, you know, what they're saying yes to. That's, that's really the main reason we have it. Um, so good question. What is your favorite? Uh, what is your favorite moment of Holy Week? Um, boy, that is a really good question. I would say, for me, I, I think I'd have to go with the Easter Vigil, my favorite moment of Holy Week. That's uh, Easter Vigil. I think is always the most beautiful liturgy that that we that the church has. So I'd have to I'd have to go with that. Um, yeah, there's different. I mean, there's different beautiful parts to all the different liturgies. But I'd say Holy Week is, or excuse me. Um, Easter Vigil would be my, my number one, my go-to there. So, okay. During Holy Week, should, should the daily rosary be the sorrowful mystery? Um, I don't know if this is going to help at all, but it's up to you. <laughs> the uh, daily rosary, um, it, it, that, I would say that could be a very good, pious devotion to do for it to be the, uh, for it to be the sorrowful mysteries. It doesn't have to be. Um, the traditional days, there's traditional days that are supposed to be sorrowful mystery, glorious mystery, luminous mysteries, um, and joyful ones. But all those depend. I mean, you can certainly do the glorious mysteries on a day. They're supposed to be the sorrowful mysteries. There's no set church teaching on that because it's a private devotion. So um, so that would just be my, yeah, that, that would be my, I guess, thoughts there. You, yeah, if you want to, that'd be a wonderful way to help maybe enter into Holy Week. But it uh, certainly doesn't have to be. Why are only two candles lit? Um, because it is a normal, it's just a normal weekday mass. So a normal weekday mass during Holy Week. So uh, yeah, we light two candles. If it's a solemnity or feast day or something like that, we light more. If the bishop was here, we'd light seven. We usually, <laughs> um, the bishop usually gets a seventh candle along with the, the six for a solemnity. But yeah, it's just normal weekday. So we just, we have two candles lit. Uh Father, please help. Give me something to focus on for today during this Monday of Passion Week. 
oh, well, um, there's a lot to focus on. Um, gosh, those are always, these are always the hardest ones where they're, they're open-ended <laughs> like this. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot. Uh, you know, looking at the daily readings for this, I think, are, um, are helpful. Uh, you know, the daily readings we have during Passion Week to find different things to focus on. Um, certainly, so the one, you know, the, the Passion Narrative that we'll read, John's Passion Narrative, which we'll read on uh, the Good Friday Liturgy, um, that's a beautiful one to certainly focus on uh, and, and help enter into. Um, and, you know, I, I think especially, I think using that and especially the scriptures, that's beautiful because it's almost like, it's really like the Lord's then directing you and having you focus on something. Um, so, yeah, maybe that's what, I'll, yeah, I'll go with that. The uh, Passion Narrative of John. So if you uh, look in, in John's Gospel, um, it's going to be starting around chapter 16, 17, um, and, and going forward. In, uh, in, in the Passion Narrative of John's Gospel, um, then, you know, and just be, you know, bring it before the Lord and say, Jesus, what would you like me to focus on, right? Because it could be a million different things for different people. There's a lot of, there's a lot of different things there to, uh, you know, to, that can grab our hearts, our, our attention. Um, so, yeah, I'd say the Scripture is always a great place to go. Um, well, like I said, the, uh, here at the homily today, uh, that's a beautiful thing to focus on, Mary's attitude of you know, just wasting the, the aromatic nard, this expensive perfume, um, you know, focusing on how Jesus wastes his life for us, and so we're called to waste and spend our lives extravagantly in return for him. That's another beautiful thing to focus on. So I think, I think some of those um, can, be, uh, can be big helps for us as we enter into Passion Week here. Father Peter, in the Bible, Jesus got angry several times. Is this true? I always think of God as peaceful and loving. Um, yes, it is true. And yes, God is peaceful and loving. And anger does not mean someone is not peaceful and loving. Um, anger is an emotion. And so whether it is, uh, it is good or um, sinful depends on whether it's righteous or unrighteous anger. So I think it was Thomas Aquinas said that we experience anger whenever we, and this is important, Whenever we perceive an injustice, right? Whenever we perceive an injustice, we experience anger. So um, that's important, right? Because it doesn't mean that every time, uh, you know, it, it doesn't mean that every time we get angry that we're justified in that. And so the first question to ask when uh, I'm angry or someone else is anger, angry, is there a real injustice here, right? Or is it something, or is it really, and this is probably 95% of what we get angry about, is that my preferences aren't being uh, honored or respected. It's probably most of it. I didn't get my way, so I'm angry. So I feel like that's an injustice. So first question to ask, is it actually an injustice? Um, most of the time it's probably no. But if it is an injustice, what can I reasonably be expected to do about it? Um, because the anger, God gives us that emotion so that we can correct an injustice. So we see something that is wrong, that we get angry, so that we have the strength and the energy to do something about it. Um, and so, yeah, uh, our Lord got angry um, for good reason. He, uh, he got angry um, when he drove out the um, money changers in the temple because they were buying and selling in God's house in the temple area. And so he drove them out out of anger. So that was a right use of anger. Um, and then also the other time where um, it actually says that Jesus looked around and was, uh, he, he was, uh, he looked around at the Pharisees and scribes with anger and was grieved at their hardness of heart. And it's in Mark, it's Mark chapter 2 or 3, um, but it's where the, it was the healing of the man with a um, withered hand. And so uh, this man has a withered hand, and uh, Jesus asks the Pharisees and scribes if it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath to save life rather than to destroy it, and they won't answer him. And uh, this wither, the guy with the withered hand standing there, it says Jesus looked around at them, was angry, and was grieved at their hardness of heart because they are, they're completely blind and oblivious to mercy, right, that God wants. And so Jesus goes ahead and heals this, this man with the withered hand, and then the Pharisees and, scri and everyone gets upset, and they go out and take counsel to put Jesus to death, right, right after he worked a miracle in front of them. Um, and so, yeah, what, is, what makes uh, Jesus angry? Uh, that's, really, that's actually a really good thing to pray with and focus on in the Gospels. He doesn't get angry that often, but when he does, what are the things that makes him angry? Well, um, you know, lack of, lack of love for God, right? Lack of mercy towards others, uh, lack of repentance, um, you know, a, a, a obliviousness to God's goodness and mercy to his presence, like in the, uh, in the temple area. 
um, yeah, those are the things that make, make uh, you know, make Jesus angry. And so, um, you know, that, that, that's good food for, uh, for thought for us to think about. Okay, uh, where are those things in my life, you know, and, and how, uh, you know, how am I being merciful? Or if I'm not being as merciful as I should, how can I increase mercy and repentance uh, towards others and, toward, uh, and especially repentance towards God? So no, that's a great, really good question there. Um, is there another time we will be able to pick up palms if we missed it on Sunday? Okay, we do. Okay. Okay, so we're going, we do have extra palms. We are going to be holding them until when we can gather again whenever that happens to be. Most likely the palms will be dried out at that point, but we will still have them available. So whenever, I'm a, whenever business gets back to somewhat normal, <laughs> somewhat normal um, whenever we can have people start gathering again, you will have an opportunity for, uh, for, to, for palms. Do you have any advice for those who are seeking to know God's call for their lives? With this, I mean the person has a call to a vocation. Uh, yes, very simply, pray. Pray, pray, and more prayer. Um, we can't know our vocation without prayer. It's, it's that simple. Um, without my daily prayer life, I wouldn't be a priest. It's really that simple. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have considered the priesthood. Once I entered seminary, there is no way in the world, I would have stayed in seminary if I hadn't prayed, if I hadn't had a prayer life. So uh, there's no substitute for, um, for silent prayer, uh, silent prayer in, in scriptures and reading the scriptures. That's, uh, that's going to be the key to any vocation in life. Uh, again, whether it's, you know, priesthood, uh, marriage, religious life, uh, that's abs absolutely essential. Um, and especially if we're trying to figure out our vocation, I don't really like using that term, but Prayer is less about, when we pray, it's less about us figuring out our vocation, and it's more about um, us, you know, well, I'll put it, our most fundamental vocation is to be saints, right? So before marriage or priesthood, religious life, all of those kinds of things, our, our first vocation is to be a saint. And so spending time in prayer with Jesus each day, pursuing him in the sacraments, in, the, um, in his word, uh, in silent prayer, and all of those ways, in, in you know, loving others, you know, ministry to the poor, all those kinds of things, service to others. That's our, that's our first goal. And then as we do that, as we pursue God in that way, um, I always tell people, focus on falling in love with Jesus first, and if you make that your life's priority, then he'll reveal to you, right? He'll, he will make it obvious to you um, how he wants you to practically respond to that call, whether he wants you to be married or to um, you know, be a priest or a religious, and, uh, you know, Jesus already has a wonderful, great plan for your happiness, my happiness, to make us great saints in this life. We don't have to come up with one. Um, all we have to do is say yes to it, right, and that's really what, you know, the prayer is about. Uh, prayer and, and, and sacrifice and self-surrender to him is about Jesus, is saying, Jesus, help me to get out of the way of the plan you already have for my life, and so, um, it might kind of seem like a simplistic answer, but it's, and, and when I say he'll reveal it to you, that doesn't mean he'll reveal it like that. I wish he revealed it to me that way. Um, you know, it was a couple years of discernment before entering seminary, then six more years of, in seminary, um, you know, before, and it just, it grew steadily that whole time. And so, uh, you know, that's how God will reveal it, even if it's a gradual, slow revealing of it. Um, hopefully, maybe it won't take that long for, for you as it did for me, but uh, that's, you know, that's the best advice I can give. Okay. All right, here's another one I might have to ask for help from the audience here, if, if there is a difference. Um, it says, when will a schedule for confession this week be posted? Okay, we, oh, we are doing, okay. Holy Saturday. Okay. Okay. So I'm I'm just finding out some <laughs> information I didn't know. So apparently, okay, it's posted. Okay. On our Holy Week schedule. Okay. So apparently it is posted on our Holy Week schedule. So we'll have confessions here Saturday. Father Jim Rolf is going to be leading those or offering those, and we weren't sure the time. It's posted apparently. Um, so that's, okay. 
So, but that's some new information I just found out. So, so we'll see about who all will be there. Um, but then, so that, uh, so I guess that would be the scheduled time. But then there's also, um, so look at the Facebook page for that, um, our Holy Week schedule. But then we're also uh, available for uh, private confessions. So, um, you know, if uh, if you need to go to confession, you can feel free to shoot us an email. Our emails are right there on the um, on the website and uh, to, to schedule something. So, ten to one. Okay, ten to one on Saturday. Okay, um, good. All right, I think that confession question was our last one. That's a good uh, good place to end, unless something comes in here last minute. Oh, yep, we got we got one right right at the end here. Um, Recently, during prayer, recently during prayer time, my six-year-old said, "God said to her, Heaven is already on Earth, and it's right here in our home.' Could you comment on the truth of this?" Um, well, that's uh, that's that's very beautiful. It's very beautiful that right we're having our kids kids pray, um, and uh, you know I certainly you know certainly want to encourage that right if you know as, as parents and families if we're, you know, we want to be teaching and encouraging our kids to pray and listen to god um and i think uh, kids probably listen a little bit better than uh, probably adults do <laughs> especially to the the movements of, of god at, at times um you know certain there's certainly you know there's certainly truth in that right that we're not meant to um you know that we're not meant to be um you know we're not meant to be like these you know gloomy people that are just, you know, looking forward to, you know, the life to come and, and aren't, uh, you know, aren't happy or joyful here, right? No, so certainly, and that's what we believe about the sacraments, right? That God is giving us his life to live the heavenly life, to live the life of, of God's kingdom here and now on earth. Uh, now, theologically, and so I guess this would say, you know, and I don't would necessarily say that you'd have to start explaining this to a six-year-old, right? So, but, you know, um, we also believe that the fullness of of heaven is after this life, right? That we are not um, we are not made for this earthly life. If that were the case, right, then when Jesus died, part of the redemption would have been to just extend our earthly life to infinity, and that's not what he did. Um, he died, suffered, he suffered, died, and rose again so that death could be transformed, so that death is no longer something we fear, but it is now a passageway into eternal life in heaven. Um, so yeah, on one, on one level, it's certainly... Um, it's certainly beautiful and true that, you know, yes, we have the heavenly life, we have God's life, we have the sacraments, his life given to us here and now in, in this life. Um, so in that sense, we can certainly say that heaven is, 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 uh, is made present here. Um, but yeah, we don't have it in its fullness until, um, you know, until we, uh, we don't experience it in its fullness until we, we pass away from this life. So we, cer we certainly have uh, much more to look forward to at the, at the end of our lives. So I hope that, hope that helps a bit. Well, good. Well, thank you all so much for those questions. They were great, and I hope you have a blessed rest of the day, and I will see you all here tomorrow. God bless.